Okay. Is this on? There we go. Okay. Well, thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here. <clears throat> I hope I don't put everyone asleep for the next speakers here right after lunch in a warm room. Um, so I am going to give just a, a, an overview, and we're going to take a tour of North America and some of the systems, the crop livestock systems that are in place and a lot of the research that's been done and is continuing to be done uh, on these systems. There's a lot of potential for them. But first of all, why are we even talking about crop livestock and crop livestock integrated systems? Because our agriculture, we know, has been very successful in this country in terms of productivity, efficiency, profitability. We've done a tremendous job, right? Think about it. Less than 2% of the population is actually producing all, the, all of our agricultural output. But there's been some unintended consequences as a result of the prevailing very specialized production systems that we have now in our country. And one of them being low diversity, low biodiversity, and the intensive inputs to keep those systems going. Um, and then we have, as a result of this specialization, we have increasing insect, weed, and disease problems. So for example, the simple corn soybean rotation used to take care of the corn rootworm, right? You had one year soybeans, corn rootworm was gone. Wasn't an issue. You didn't need to use insecticide on corn after soybeans. Now it's adapted to have that extended diapause, so one year soybeans isn't enough to take care of the corn rootworm. We have, uh, with the Roundup Ready, we have weed resistance that's developed in a big way and is becoming a huge problem. Disease problems like more and more soybeans. We have a lot of cor uh, soybean cyst nematode across the Midwest. Those are just some of the examples. And I'll be showing some other examples from other parts of the world like, or of the country like stagnant yields, especially like, for example, down south in uh, stagnating peanut and, and especially cotton yields are, are stagnating and even going down in these simple rotations that we're using. And not to mention all the environmental problems that have resulted uh, from these systems, like we have soil erosion degradation, therefore we have sedimentation of our reservoirs, water contamination with nutrient runoff, the Lake Erie toxic algal blooms, hypoxic zones in the Gulf of Mexico, so the eutrophication of surface and marine waters, and then I'm going to talk a little about a little bit about the depleting groundwater reserves from over-irrigation. And not to mention the nutrient imbalances where we have our specialized crop fields where we're putting on fertilizer, we're bringing in nutrients versus our concentrated animal feeding units, the big animal uh, feeding operations where we have too many nutrients and the problem is nutrient overload in those systems. So this is why there's growing interest in among researchers as well as producers with more of an ecological mindset on integrated systems. Let's think about putting the animals and the crops back together to increase the biodiversity through longer rotations, especially with perennials. And in this group that would be a very welcome thing. I'm not I'm kind of talking to the choir today. And those can provide valuable environmental services. We can have, we can capture ecological interactions in these more diverse systems. And I'll, I'll show some examples of that. And of course, we can diversify our income on a practical level. And this can become more of an issue if the government starts to move out of our price support system. Okay? In countries where they don't have price supports for grain, there's a lot more going on in integrated crop livestock systems, like in New Zealand, Australia, and Brazil, where they don't have price supports for grain. There's a lot more interest among producers in diversifying their operations. So going on the tour, 
we're going to look at these main components that fit into integrated systems. Sod-based crop rotations, by that I mean having perennial crops in our rotations like we used to. Cover crops on a shorter term using cover crops for forage and grazing within grain crop rotations. Even shorter than that would be putting animals on crop residues, utilizing them that way. So we're getting some animals in that grain or crop system. Sod intercropping and overseeding, like uh, overseeding Bermuda grass pastures in the south for winter uh, grazing to extend that grazing. And then we have some crops like winter wheat that we can actually use for two purposes. And this goes on a lot in Kansas and Oklahoma where you can graze the wheat for a short time until it starts going reproductive and then you let it go on for grain production. So those are all some examples um, of how we can use these different practices in integrated systems. And I'll, I'm going to give you some examples now from different parts of the country. So I'll start with a cool, which is now cold, <laughs> humid region here north of us, just slightly north of us and then out in the Pacific Northwest. And um, in this region, probably the closest thing that comes to an integrated system would be our dairy production, our dairy farms, where we still have the annual crop, mainly corn, grown for silage, with a perennial hay crop, grass or forage, forage grass legume um, uh, systems, OK? being rotated, so we have some longer rotations going on with our hay crops. Um, but they are confinement systems for the most part. We have some a lot more grazing growing, but um, they are mainly confinement. But the, the animal nutrients, the manure, is being put back on uh, to produce the annual crops. So we do have some of that integration on the same land. Now, they aren't truly integrated in the sense that a lot of dairy farmers don't market any kind of grain. So that would really be more of a truly integrated is on some farms where they also have a cash crop. Okay? But this is probably the closest thing we come to in terms of using long-term sod rotations um, and, and having perennials and annual crops. Now, on, on these farms, there's an opportunity to use cover crops. So another component of an integrated system, especially on corn silage land, and this is a study we did right, right there on campus in, in Columbus. And so on a lot of dairy farms, we have our corn silage coming off late August, early September, and then it sits idle until the following spring. But we can grow a cover crop, and we planted annual ryegrass, and then we compared that to oats plus cereal rye. And this is a shot in November, so it was planted in mid-September. In November, we had this beautiful cover. We start grazing it with our heifers. It's already frosted here. You can see the oats are frosted, burned back a little bit. And we grazed that starting around Thanksgiving time and went on into January until we were done with the grazing and the snow covered it up. And then the next spring, um, the cover crop starts growing back. And this is early March, mid-March. You can see the rye is coming on a lot earlier than the annual rye grass on the right. So we learned if we want early spring grazing, rye works a lot better than annual rye grass. So we were able to graze that, especially the rye, through April plant the corn silage again, and then we could repeat that whole process all over again. So really, a lot of times with these systems, you're actually intensifying the use of the land. You're getting, and you're keeping roots growing uh, year round on that land. So these are some of the results we found. We produced from one and a half to as much as 3.7 tons per acre of forage dry matter, and that included the spring production. And this was with the cereal rye in the spring that we got that high number. 1.8 pounds average daily gain. And that was the average of Holsteins and Jerseys. The Holsteins were about 2.1 pounds per animal per day. 
and we produced enough forage that carried 56 to 80 animal unit days per acre, animal unit being a thousand pound animal equivalent. The subsequent corn silage yield was not reduced by the grazing, so there is no real compaction effect. At, in the spring, after the termination of the cover crop, we had 23% increase in particulate organic carbon in the soil, three times the soil microbial biomass, so all this is positive for nutrient cycling and improving the soil. And that's been shown in a lot of other studies as well. In this area, though, in the specialized grain systems, it's mainly a corn-soybean rotation. In some, we have a limited amount of acreage of winter wheat. So this gets to be more of a challenge to grow a cover crop. But there are some opportunities here, and producers are trying things. Here in central Ohio, there's a group of producers that are flying on rye over corn in late August. If we get rain, it works pretty well. If we don't, it doesn't, obviously. But they're growing, throw, throwing on this rye in, in the end of August, and then in October, after the corn comes off in November, they're putting beef cattle out to graze that. And it's a nice supplement that uh, oat forage or rye forage is a good supplement to the corn stover makes a nice uh, high protein supplement built right in. If we have wheat, we have a lot of opportunities for cover crops because the wheat comes off in mid-July. We can plant the sorghum grasses and actually produce up to four tons of dry matter per acre by September with those. Or we can wait till August and plant oats or another small grain and then graze that starting in mid-October, November, and on into the winter. And here's an example of oats planted in early August. This is uh, October 12th. Bob Hendershot's outstanding in his field there. And uh, then we start grazing that in November, and on into, uh, this is uh, February, actually. They're still grazing. And uh, August planted forage will produce up to two and a half tons per acre of dry matter. If we wait till September, we're down to a ton or less of dry matter per acre because of shorter season. And uh, a lot of time, most of the time, this forage is higher quality than the hay that's being fed these animals at this time of year. Okay. So you think, oh, that's crap, but it's better than a lot of the hay that we're feeding our cows during the winter. So it's been a great system. A lot of producers are using this. The other opportunity I mentioned is uh, crop residue grazing. This has been a common practice for many years, especially out in Iowa and Nebraska further west, but it's growing in um, here in the eastern Corn Belt as well. Great opportunity. A lot of feed out there on our corn land that's not being utilized, okay? And then you're spreading the manure on that land. A 16-year study in Nebraska showed on a silty claim lo loam soils that there was no detrimental effects of this grazing on the soil properties and on subsequent crop yields. That's always a concern of the grain producer. Is, is that compaction going to damage my yields? Well, fall grazing corn residue actually increased the following soybean yield by 3.4 bushels per acre over the 16-year period in a corn-soybean rotation. It increased soil microbial activity, like it's been shown over and over again. No differences in soil organic matter, nitrogen, phosphorus, or potassium tests. Some increased, there was some compaction, some increase in soil penetration resistance, but nothing that, be, that became a problem, okay? Did not inhibit root growth. Hmm? Um, I don't know the details, but usually you try to get them through pretty quick. And see, out west, you don't have the wet soils, or if it's wet, it's usually frozen by then, so you can time it that way. So it is a concern. It is something that has to be managed. Okay? You can do a lot of damage if you don't manage it right. This is some work done at Illinois, a very interesting 
very, uh, very nice system where they compared continuous corn, okay, versus an integrated system that had perennial cool season pasture that was grazed in the summer, and then a, a 7% of the area was also warm season grasses to fill in that late summer um, slump when our cool season pastures give out. And then half the grain area was in oat grain, and then a cover crop planted after that of rye and brassica and oats. And then the other half was in corn grain, and they flopped those back and forth. And so in late fall, they started strip grazing uh, that area, so they had the nice cover crop over here and with the corn grain residue right beside it, so they had the high quality supplemented with a little more roughage on the corn residue. They showed total nitrogen, total soil nitrogen and carbon increased in the integrated system compared to the continuous corn. Soil aggregate size, so structure was improved of the soil. They had 6.5% more corn grain yield compared to continuous corn. That was the rotation effect, as well as the, the manure being added. They had a four and a half fold decrease in weed biomass in the integrated system, so less herbicide use. Okay, so a lot of positive benefits in this system. Now I did mention, and you asked about treading damage, and this is a concern, especially as we move east. Our soils don't freeze as much. We get a little wetter falls, so, but it's something that you do have to manage and can be managed. Okay, now this is some work from Iowa, and they looked at several indicators of comparing a two-year corn soybean rotation, a three-year corn soybean, and then a small grain uh, plus underseeded with red clover, or a four-year where they had corn soybean, small grain underseeded with alfalfa, and then one more year of alfalfa. So they had a two, three, and four-year rotation. I'm going to show you a bicycle wheel, one wheel for each of these systems superimposed on each other, and the different indicators are the spokes of the wheel. The, the, the rotation with the highest value was set at one, and anything below that, a fraction of one, depending on the, the percent decrease. Okay? So, here's the three spokes. Uh, the three bicycle wheels. So let's just go up here to the top. The, the solid line with the solid circle is the two-year rotation. We actually had lower soybean yield. I think it was about 10% less than in the two and th than in the three and four-year rotation. Okay? Maize yield or corn yield also was actually a little higher in the three and four-year rotation than in the two year corn soybean rotation, but not a big difference. Weed seed bank depletion was equal for all three. Total harvested crop mass was higher for the longer rotations, a little bit higher. And overall profit was the same for all three systems. So the idea that you can't have a longer rotation make equal profit is a fallacy. Now the bottom half of the wheel starts to show the big differences. Labor. It takes a lot more labor on a four-year rotation compared to a two-year. Why? Because you're making hay, right? Or you're managing animals in that system. The corn-soybean rotation is very easy. That's why we have so much of it. Plus, with government price helping you out in the bad years, why wouldn't you do it? It's the way it is, unfortunately. Um, energy use, a lot higher in the corn-soybean rotation to the, compared to the longer rotations that used about half as much energy. A huge decrease in amount of nitrogen used in the two, three and four year rotation because of the nitrogen fixation going on in those uh, legumes. And then herbicide use tremendously less compared to the two year rotation. They also looked at freshwater toxicity a lot less with the longer rotations. So the idea is that we have some biological synergies going on with a little bit of input and it goes a long ways 
And there's a lot of environmental benefit we can have with these longer rotations. <clears throat> now, let me move on to the cool, dry region or where seasons are even shorter. Now, we can use the long-term rotations there as well, just like I showed you here in the Midwest. So the, the three- or four-year uh, hay crops with the grain crops, that works very well in that region. But there's even work going on for using cover crops in this region, okay? And you'd think, how in the world do they do that? Well, what they're doing is they're windrowing their crop residues and they're windrowing their cover crops after a shorter season grain crop. So like after wheat, they would grow this cover crop and they are um, trying windrowing it but not baling it to save the cost of baling and feeding hay. And the idea is the windrows are a little easier to find under the snow. It's People are doing it. They're showing benefits to this. So even in these regions where you think it's extremely difficult to do this kind of integration, where there's a will, there's a way. I want to show you now, go to the south, southwest, the warm, hot, dry region. In this region, water use is, is actually um, is, is the issue, in reducing irrigation use, especially because the Ogallala Aquifer is being depleted at an alarming rate or taking out a lot more per year than is being recharged. That is not sustainable. Eventually it's going to run out if we keep doing it this way. So uh, Texas Tech, uh, starting with Vivian Allen and now Chuck West carrying on this work, have done some very interesting work comparing say continuous cotton, which is a prevailing production system in that region, compared to, with irrigation, compared to a fairly complex crop livestock integrated system. They take half the area out of cotton production, put it, put it into a perennial warm season pasture that's grazed. It was old world blue stems, I believe, uh, was the pasture. Then the other half had a rotation where they had cotton, followed by a, a winter cover crop of wheat that was grazed. So for the winter grazing and, and fall, winter, spring grazing, and then fallow to save water, and then back to another cover crop of rye that was grazed, and then back to cotton. So their results. The integrated system reduced irrigation water use by 25%. Okay, so there was a savings in water. You still had to apply water, but not as much. Soil erosion potential was decreased. Nitrogen fertilizer was reduced by 36%. Energy use was decreased. Chemical inputs were decreased. All this work is published. Uh, carbon sequestration was increased. Soil microbial activity was increased, like other studies have shown when you add animals into the system, soil and perennials. Soil aggregates were, in, were increased, which better soil structure means uh, more water infiltration in the soil. Income diversification and profit potential was increased, but managerial requirements were also increased. There's always a cost. These systems are more complicated to manage. They take more management input. They aren't as easy, right, as continuous cotton. Okay, so that's, that's the cost. Finally, I'll show you what's going on, what's being done in, south, in the southeast region. Some of you are a lot more familiar with this than I am. But this is a region where it's probably the easiest to develop these integrated systems because we have a longer growing season, easier to establish cover crops and get good growth for grazing. So a lot of opportunity in this area. This area is similar to what's going on in southern Brazil where they're doing a lot of this work with integrated systems. Um, you can have winter cover crops, say after corn or peanuts. So we can grow annual ryegrass after peanuts or cotton, for example, graze that, or rye. We can have summer cover crops after winter wheat, like sorghum sedan for grazing. 
Um, so there's a lot of opportunities for cover crops in between the, the crop rotations there. And some very interesting work, to me anyway, in reading it and talking with a few people about it, is this work where they were looking at improving peanut and cotton yields with an integrated system. And this is where cotton yields have stagnated in the southeast, and peanut yields as well. So the idea was, let's get it back into a longer rotation. So they tried two years of Bahia grass. The first year was hay. The second year was grazed. I think now they're actually grazing both years. And then desiccated goes to peanut the third year, followed with an oak cover crop, and then to cotton, another oak cover crop, and back to Bahia grass. And so this system broke the insect and disease cycles that were plaguing the peanuts and cotton. It increased peanut yield and increased fiber uh, quality of the cotton. So this is the peanut yields, a 28% increase in peanut after two years of Bahia grass compared to uh, peanut after two years of cotton. Okay, 28% yield increase in peanut. Cotton yield increased a little bit more in the four-year uh, system compared to uh, cotton in, in the, the cotton, cotton, peanut rotation. But more importantly than the yield increase was the improvement in the fiber quality. Okay? When they did the profit analysis, the economic analysis, there was a three-and-a-half-fold increase with the integrated system. Okay, $25 per acre per year in the cotton, cotton, peanut rotation compared to $83 per acre per year in the, in the hay and in the Bahia grass and uh, peanut cotton rotation. So this is very impressive. Uh, I hear there's producers uh, adopting this and they're continuing to work on this. I don't have time to get into uh, uh, a lot of work with uh, trees adding into the system. Brazil's doing a lot of work with this. We need to pay attention to what they're doing and learning from it. There's a lot of good work going on this in different regions of the U.S. A lot of uh, management options to look at in adding trees into our pasture and crop systems. Something to look at down the road. So, if we look at a timeline, we think about, okay, we, right now, we're having a lot of emphasis on, uh, minimum, on, on reduced tillage for conservation and cover crop use. As producers get adept at establishing cover crops and having success with them, I think hopefully one day the, the day is going to come when they're going to look out there on that cover crop and say, I could make more money from that if I put it through an animal. That's what happened in Brazil. And so then, you add animals into the system, suddenly you're open to more diverse rotations with perennials. Uh, you see the opportunities to have more diversified income, so you're moving into sod rotations, more integrated systems, and then finally agroforestry, and above this is the YouTube videos, right, that we heard about. Okay, so in conclusion, there's a lot of opportunities for integrated systems, improving integration in our production systems in, in our country. Um, <clears throat> they can improve soil and water quality while also being profitable with good management. Most grain producers, though, probably are not at all interested. Uh, there's few incentives to diversify as long as the government keeps propping up our, our grain system. Uh, grain producers who have ruminant livestock, though, who have some cattle, are more likely to integrate the two activities and be interested in this. I think we're going to need some changes, not only in producer attitudes in general, but also in the agricultural policies and the incentives that they create in order for us to really start seeing a big improvement in the number of integrated crop livestock systems we have in this country. With that, that's uh, your introduction to integrated crop livestock systems. And I think I'm out of time. Okay. Yeah. Um, okay.
That's a good question. And it's been a few years since uh, we did that. But it, it was uh, with a, um, so we took the soil. You know, I can't remember all the details, but it was an incubation and then measuring the gas with the, since uh, my grad student was the one that did it all. So it was uh, one of the standard methods. So 